Thank you, Adrian, and that's for for that lovely piece of music. And hopefully our Sabbath today brings us closer to the heart of God. And also the prayer journey that uh, Pastor Rick and Marissa just um, directed our minds towards um, today. Good morning, University Church. Happy Sabbath to you. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. May his grace and his goodness and his mercy and his presence be with us this morning as we continue to worship and as we um, meditate for a few moments around um, the word of God. I've already been blessed by the music and the prayer and and even the diversity that's reflected in our midst. Um, one of our prayers was uh, in Arabic. And I know that God understands, um, but in my heart I understood that um, we are on a journey together as individuals in um, our experience of drawing near to the heart of God. Amen? I want to... Um, uh, reread our scripture for this morning uh, in a different translation, the Message Bible. I don't usually uh, go to the Message Bible, but on occasion um, I do uh, just to uh, get a feel for um, Eugene Peterson's creative imagery um, and uh, how he he often paraphrases the intent of the text. Actually, we'll just read three verses, the first three verses. If you have your Bible open, you're welcome to look at it. But um, it begins with the word so. So, if you, if you are serious about living this new resurrection life with Christ... Act like it. Pursue the things over which Christ presides. Don't shuffle along, eyes to the ground, absorbed with the things right in front of you. Look up and be alert to what is going on around Christ. That's where the action is. See things from his perspective. Your old life is dead. Your new life, which is your real life, even though invisible to spectators, is with Christ in God. He is your life. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, this morning as we come to your word here in Colossians, we invite your Holy Spirit to be with us, that you will fill us, and um, stretch our imagination in terms of the reality of what it means to be risen with Christ today. That we can live in a reality that is already a reality. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things that I learned when I moved to um, Lebanon was that there is more than one Easter. Um, you know, I'd been a pastor for many years, and yes, I had studied church history, East Church, West Church, and all that, but I guess it just never really clicked in my mind that there were two Easter's. You know, I was a, a familiar with some of the traditions, you know, that go along with Easter, but it must not have clicked. It evidently didn't click in my mind that, you know, these are separate dates, actual separate dates and uh, traditions that go around uh, those, those separate dates. And um, so I come to Lebanon, I learn that, and um, we have different um, religious groups that uh, relate to these things. And um, I, I say to myself, this is, this is confusing or it's bigger than what I thought. <clears throat> or at least it extends the, the Easter journey 
for us as, uh, here as a university community, we have both Easter's off. Now, I've never had that in my life, you know, until I come to Lebanon. And um, so now I have two Easter's off, and I got two weekends, okay, of Easter celebration. Now, if I'm part of a, uh, another religious community, I will begin the Easter focus 40 days ahead, you know, beginning with Ash um, uh, uh, Sunday and, and uh, uh, the, the, the Lent experience where, where you are drawn into, where our religious uh, neighbors uh, are drawn into the experience of Jesus in the wilderness and the temptation for 40 days. So um, uh, these are realities that um, uh, we experience. The, the, whole, the whole Easter tradition is kind of stretched out in our imagination. And the reality is, is that we often become numb to um, that stretching out because this doesn't apply to us. This applies to us. This weekend, this weekend is not for us. This weekend is for us. So all the things we hear about it going on in this weekend, we just kind of tune out because that's not what we're about, all right? Um, and then you have a whole bunch of traditions that go along with Easter. Um, we could name a few, but um, I just uh, returned from the U.S. and um, my, my, uh, my grandkids, uh, uh, celebrated an Easter tradi tradition at our home, I learned that my youngest son brought his two kids and his wife to, to our house where my oldest son lives, and they had an Easter egg hunt. And my, my oldest son hid all kinds of things in the woods and in the grass and behind the flowers, and, and they had a wonderful time searching for special gifts and eat Easter eggs uh, uh, on, on Easter Sunday. And um, I could go down the list of things. Um, just last Sabbath, I, um, uh, no, the Sabbath before, the Sabbath before, um, I spent uh, worship at Loma Linda University Church, which was an Easter focus. It was a communion service. Can you imagine? coming into church, getting a, a little uh, lavender bag. And you open up that lavender bag, and in that bag is a full can of Welch's grape juice. In that bag is a three by five, uh, at least a three by five piece of communion bread. And um, the music is gorgeous. Actually, very uplifting, very energizing, very, um, very moved my heart, touched my heart. I was glad to be there. I was glad to experience it. But then when, when um, the pastor gets up and says, well, you know, uh, this is a communion Sabbath also. We had the foot washing last night, and this morning now um, we're going to break the bread and the, the juice. He says, I want everybody to take your can out, and uh, your, 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 your can of juice. And so we all took it out. And he says, I want us to open it all at once. I don't want it to be opened, click, 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 click. And suddenly, the church became alive with snap, you know, as all the cans of uh, grape juice were opened at the same time. So then uh, the pastor said, you know, if you read the Bible carefully, um, the, the, the Lord's Supper, they were eating through the night. They were sitting around a table, and Jesus was talking. And while Jesus was talking, they were eating. And so this communion service is you can drink your juice and you can eat your bread while I am talking about the two men on their way to Emmaus and Jesus walking with them. Now, I had never had a communion service like this in my life. Um, 
But it was different. And it did jog the mind about the difference between traditions that often numb our thinking, okay, and the, the um, ability for us to, to grasp a larger reality that's, that's um, happening. I also found myself um, um, uh, saying uh, on, on Sunday, the Sunday afterwards, I was, I was walking and running, and I thought to myself, you know, um, I really haven't given a lot of thought to Easter. So here we are today, not that I hadn't given thought, but you know, life gets busy. And sometimes you focus on things only when they are official. That's what I was saying in my mind while I was walking and I was running. So this morning, for just a few moments, I want to ask the question, now that Easter is over, now what? Now what? Will we think a lot about Easter in August? Likely not in December when it's Christmas. When are, when are we going to be thinking about Easter and what Easter is about? In fact, I noticed after the, the um, Western Easter, okay, which we are part of, after the Western Easter, you could already see in the stores things, you know, e Easter paraphernalia and um, candies and so forth going on sale. In fact, I, the, the, the next weekend I was in Berrien Springs and I had the privilege of seeing my grandkids, uh, two of them at least, and um, here I'm sitting on the couch and my granddaughter comes in with an Easter rabbit and she's eating this milk chocolate Easter rabbit. And of course, even here in Lebanon, you can find the little Easter eggs that the candy stores make um, long after Easter is over. And usually, when I have some of them put into the bowl of chocolate on my desk or, or uh, on my table there in my office, I don't think of Easter when I pick them up. I'm asking myself, is this dark chocolate or is this milk chocolate in here? My point is, is that um, what happens when Easter is over? Now that Easter is over, now what? You know, most of the time, we, we equate Easter with um, the resurrection of Jesus, which is the past. And um, then we calculate whew, that is going to now um, assure us of a resurrection in the future. It's, it's like a friend of mine who lost um, his son, um, who was electrocuted working at a church uh, soon after he was baptized, 19-year-old um, young man, every August I text my friend and tell him I'm thinking about him and praying for him at the loss of his son nearly 30 years ago. I asked my friend Steve once, when you think of resurrection, where does your mind go? Does it go back to Jesus coming forth from the tomb? Or does it go forward? He says it always goes forward because I want to see my son Daniel again. Usually when we think of resurrection, we think in the, of the realm of death, right? Resurrection is linked to death. 
And um, so we have this idea that someday we may die and then resurrection will be something in the future. I want to challenge us this morning with yes, Easter takes us backward and our Advent hope takes us forward. But I would challenge us to think that the centrality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the New Testament, in the scriptures, um, yes, has a historical dimension to it. Yes, has a future final dimension to it as well. But I would remind us that the resurrection of Jesus took place here on earth. And because it took place here on earth, his resurrection recasts our understanding of resurrection. The resurrection doesn't suddenly get everybody into heaven. If you understand what I'm saying. When Jesus was resurrected, he did not go to heaven right away. Jesus was here. And the disciples and the people around him experienced him as the resurrected Christ here on earth. And they who also were on earth at the time, living, gained an understanding of the resurrection. And that's what I want to talk about for a few moments this morning. I want to ask the question, how does the resurrection of Jesus Christ recast our understanding of the resurrection? How does, our, uh, how does the resurrection of Jesus Christ recast our understanding of the resurrection so that we move beyond Easter and we live into the reality that is already a reality and that we are resurrected with Christ. We are resurrected with Christ. Our passage puts it this way, and I will read again from the Message Bible. So, if you are serious about living the new resurrection life with Christ, act like it. Pursue the things over which Christ presides. Don't shuffle along, eyes to the ground, absorbed with the things right in front of you. Look up and be alert to what is going on around Christ. That is where the action is, where Jesus is, what Jesus is doing. See things from his perspective. Jesus was radically reconfigured and uh, redefined by his resurrection. I want you to think of it for a few moments. When we think of resurrection, we normally think of something in the future. We think of waking up in heaven. You know, most of the Christian world thinks of it as waking up in heaven. And now we're with God and in a total different reality. No, Jesus, when he's resurrected, he's resurrected on earth and he continues. He eats fish. He eats bread. Um, you can touch him, you can hear him, you can see him, but he can also pass through doors. He can also appear and disappear. Uh, there's a lot of things about Jesus that are totally different. And when the Apostle John sees Jesus later on in the book of Revelation, he sees the exalted, uh, resurrected, glorified uh, uh, King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus has eyes like a fire and feet like fire and, and, and his, his, his face shines like the sun. So the resurrected Jesus is totally different than what we um, often imagine about the resurrected Jesus. And so the resurrection of Jesus casts a total different picture. The disciples were familiar with the concept of resurrection as life after death, but suddenly they begin to see what resurrection life can be like, could be like, should be like. And then their own lives began mirroring these things. 
And all you have to do is read the book of Acts. The book of Acts where it says we are giving witness to the resurrection of Jesus. Well, how were they giving witness to the resurrection of Jesus? It had to do with the, the choices that they were making, the, 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 the services that they were providing for each other, the way in which they were healing people, the way in which they were um, uh, caring for people. Uh, you can go down the list. You can, you can read about the the radical transformation of the first century church within 30 years. Within 30 years, the, the Christian church had reached out and touched every part of the civilized world within 30 years, transforming lives. Why? How? Well, it was because they had come into connection with the risen Christ and the resurrection of Jesus had recast their idea of resurrection, that resurrection was not something just in the future, somewhere out there. But now resurrection had to do with today. Resurrection had to do with who I am. Resurrection has to do with the core of the gospel. Resurrection has to do with the core of who I am as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus Christ. And so it's not only about my final destiny. It's not only about what Jesus did um, 2,000 years ago, but it's about what Jesus is doing now, what Jesus can do now. It's about living into the reality that is already a reality. And that is what our text is saying. We have been, lit, we have been risen with Christ. Amen? Amen? And in the New Testament, just the Apostle Paul himself has over 50 references to, to resurrection. He talks about being buried with Christ and raised with Christ. He, he says that we too might walk in newness of life. Jesus walked in newness of life after his resurrection. We too walk in newness of life when we have experienced Jesus in our hearts and our lives and experienced the resurrection power in our lives. The Apostle Paul says, I want to know the power of the resurrection and the sufferings of Jesus. And someday I want to experience also the resurrection of the dead. But I want to experience the power of the resurrection now, today, in my life. And when you read First and Second um, Corinthians, you see all the trials and the burdens and the struggles that the Apostle Paul had, how many times he was beaten, how many times he was stoned, how many times he floated on the open Mediterranean, uh, because of a shipwreck, how many times he was hungry at night, how many times he was um, made fun of and ridiculed and, and um, uh, imprisoned and all these things. And yet he persevered and yet he maintained a, a, a positive attitude and, and yet he continued to minister and yet he continued to speak boldly and unashamedly about Jesus. That is what the resurrection, the view of the resurrection does. That is what the reality of resurrection brings to our lives. And so we have the words, whether it's from Colossians, whether it's from Philippians, whether it's from Ephesians, whether it's from, from Romans, we have, as Christ was raised, dot, 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 we too. We have words raised up with him. That I might know the power of his resurrection. You also were raised with him. If then, as our text says today, if then... You have been raised with Christ. Resurrection is a reality that is already 
reality into which we are called to live today as sons and daughters of God. Jesus brings us a new life, which is our real life. Jesus is our life. This is what resurrection is and how it's intended to recast our sense of self. So our text then goes on not to the future resurrection, but a present resurrection. There is a new self. There is a new identity. There is a new life. There is a new reality. And these things have to do with our thoughts and our, our, our vision, our worldview, our character, our values, our actions, and our attitudes. And if you look at the, our, our, our text for today, um, in Colossians 3, verse 5, after these words that we, we're talking about here, um, the Apostle Paul says, Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. So he's saying, okay, if you are, are, are resurrected with Jesus, then you consider yourself dead to all these other realities of human existence that are present in our world today. These, these things that, that go against the, the grain of the character of God. These things that really are the opposite of resurrection life. Life here on this world, this planet, is full of greed and, and um, uh, racism and bigotry and prejudice and brokenness and anger and greed and Im impurity and immorality. And we can go down the list of what, th what life on this planet has as its core. And Paul is saying, if we are serious about living the resurrection life with Jesus, then we need to act like it. And acting like it means that we sense that the, the resurrection is a reality that's already a reality, and we are to live into that reality. We come into that reality as broken, hurting, uh, frail um, uh, individuals and uh, with, with checkered pasts, but the, the power of God's resurrection uh, the, the, the work of Jesus Christ in our life that the resurrection points to uh, uh, enables us. It creates a framework of which we can actually become like Jesus in our world over a course of time. We live into, we live into the reality that is already a reality. And that's the challenge of our text. Our resurrected Christ is exalted at the right hand of God. And because he's there, he sends his Holy Spirit. And because he's there, we can stand firm and persevere. He has the power of an indestructible life. That's what it tells us in Hebrews. And because of that, he intercedes in our behalf. He prays for us just like he's inviting us, like Marissa shared with and, and Pastor Rick um, earlier uh, in their service. He's inviting us to pray. Jesus is interceding in our behalf. And the scriptures tell us that, that Jesus can come alongside of us when we are tempted and when we are weary. And um, we are told 
um, that he can, he can help us when we're tempted because he's, he suffered and, and he was tempted when he was suffered. Uh, but his resurrection life is, is there. And because he, he has passed through the heavens, he's there at the Son of God, uh, uh, by the throne of God, we can have confidence to, to, to come into the presence of God and find mercy. Amen. And grace to help in the time of need. Kathy and I were um, privileged to work for seven years in the metropolitan D.C. area. And it was quite a journey. All I can say is that um, it was a journey. Um, we were privileged to be part of a congregation that the DNA of that congregation was to share their faith. And I was in the baptistry. Uh, we were baptizing people every two weeks easy. Um, God was doing profound things, beautiful things. Um, I was just absolutely amazed at what God was doing and, and observing, watching people's lives transformed. Part of my ministry was in an upscale segment of, of the population uh, realtors and so forth. Um, I've been to parties where they s uh, snorted coke through $100 bills. And um, I, I wasn't at those parties for myself. I was at those parties, you know, because I was invited to meet uh, uh, individuals and um, to, to watch God transform some people's lives, some of those people's lives. And for me to stand in the baptism, uh, baptistry pool with them was, was an absolute um, awesome privilege um, because I, I could see what the living Christ was doing uh, in the hearts of the people. Um, I remember one Sabbath in my pastor's class. I had a very active pastor's class. Um, we had 25 uh, up to 25 uh, people on a given Sabbath in my pastor's class. And um, they, they were all at different uh, levels of life. And um, I remember there was a fellow there by the name of Robbie. Um, actually, his, his wife, Gloria, uh, had been a former Adventist or raised an Adventist when she was a little girl. But um, she um, married Robert, Robbie, and um, this man was um, spaced out most of the time. I visited and had uh, Bible studies with Gloria, um, uh, bringing her back into the reality of resurrection life. Um, uh, Robbie would be um, totally zoned out on PCP or marijuana or some other um, mood altering substance and on this particular one particular sabbath he he showed up to my pastor's class and um, um i was happy to have him there because that was supportive of his wife gloria but um i i was soon a, a little nervous because he was acting erratically which was not not unnormal. I mean, he often did crazy things. But now he was doing crazy things in the pastor's class at church, you know. And um, so then I, I said, well, um, I said to one of the elders, you take over the class. And so Robbie and I went out to the parking lot. And to this day, I'll never forget he was all wound up, and he opened the trunk of his car, and he had a cooler. You know, like you have a picnic cooler? He had a cooler in the trunk. And um, he says, I got to show you this, Pastor Larry. I said, what is this? And so he opened his cooler, and out came um, uh, mist because it had been packed tight with uh, dry ice. 
And laying in that dry ice was a, a rabbit. And I said, okay, um, uh, what is this? He says, well, he says, I'm starting New Life Incorporated. Yeah. He says, yes, um, I'm going to bring this rabbit back to life. And after I bring this bat rabbit back to life, I'm going to, you know, um, uh, start this business where people, when they die, they can come back to life. And, um, yeah, I, I, I laughed, too. But I, I knew Robbie, and I loved Robbie. And my laugh was, was not a, a, you know, easy laugh. I loved his wife. I loved his family. Why do I share that story? It's because our text implies that the issue of res resurrection is exclusively God's operation. Amen. There is absolutely nothing that we can do to resurrect anything or anybody. And yes, we snicker. We snicker at that thought that someday there can be bodily resurrection. Yes, and through, this, through the years as a pastor, I have also heard the snickers that this person's life could ever change. That so-and-so was so far down the ladder and so dysfunctional that, that it was impossible. And how many times in... Our life as a pastoral couple, have we seen God do the impossible? Because with human beings, it is impossible. And so our text says, our text implies the reality that already exists in which we can live is exclusively God's operation so, since you have been raised to new life with Christ, since you have been raised. And in the, in the, the Greek, in the language, it's, it's a past tense. It's, a, it's not just a past tense, but it is a passive. It's something that happens to you. You don't do it. The text does not say, since you uh, resurrect yourself with Jesus. No, the text says, since you have been resurrected or experienced resurrection life with Jesus. It puts the power of resurrection life totally in the hands of the creator and the life giver. So when we think of living beyond Easter, when we are thinking, asking the question, now after um, Easter is over, what do we do now? When we are trying to sort through the question of does resurrection point to what Jesus did and what Jesus will do? We come to the reality that from a biblical perspective, resurrection has to do with now. Christ is risen. Amen? Amen. I'll say it again. Christ is risen. Amen. All right. And in Christ, so you. Amen? Amen? Do you believe that? Christ is risen. And in Christ, so you. So you. That is the most 
really real thing about you if you are in Christ, if you have welcomed him into your life, you have been raised with him. And you are invited to live into the reality that is already a reality. And with the power of the Holy Spirit, the breath of God in your life, you can do that. Not of yourself, but through the presence of Jesus, together with Jesus. And in doing so, you will not only pray a harvest prayer. Your life, your character, your attitudes, the way in which you treat others, the way in which you talk about others, your values, your affections, will also be harvesting because they will bear witness to others of the incredible power that Christ, the living Christ has to resurrect human beings today while we await his return.